Welcome back to the Developer Tribe, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. This podcast delves into the processes and practices of coaches, educators, and beyond, offering their insight and giving us cause to reflect. Thank you for being here, however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. My guest today is Corey Roebuck, an academy coach at Barnsley, working in the foundation phase, and a PE teacher and head of year at Leeds City College. He's a qualified football and cricket coach, passionate about the educational value of participation in sport. I was fortunate enough to meet Corey through his through my studies, and so glad to have him offer his insights today. Corey, welcome. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So, uh, give us a better sense of your journey to your current roles. Um, so currently head of year, um, head of year 11 in the 14 plus apprenticeship academy, um, as, as my main role day to day. Um, so just in a, in kind of a nutshell, uh, we are a small school within the college. Uh, we run a year 10 and year 11 provision, um, and learners come to us for a variety of reasons. Um, and we just, we, we basically run smaller classes to help learners uh, develop in their personal and academic development who struggled in a mainstream environment. Um, we are certainly an alternative environment um, with, like I said, the smaller classes, but also put more pastoral um, support in with the academic uh, support as well, just to develop the people, um, to develop the learners, but also look towards the academic side as well um, in regards to giving them a smaller number of GCSEs to focus on, which streamlines their journey and their pathway to, to where they want to go. Um, but it's exciting, challenging. Um, but certainly rewarding at times. Um, and then secondly, um, outside of that, it's, it's an academy coach at Barnsley, um, currently working with the under 12s um, in the academy. Um, I've been there for a few years now and it's, it's something I'm quite passionate about with it being my, my club and it's hometown club, supported that through, through my journey, um, watching football, playing, coaching, um, it, and it's, it's my team. So it's, it's something I'm really passionate about um, trying to develop the next generation of, um, of footballers, but not just that, but making them better people for the town um, and giving something back to those individuals to make them ultimately, like I said, better people and the best version of themselves. Is that why you got involved in, in football coaching? Um, a little bit, yes, a little bit. I think football coaching was was a second as as any kind of young young person. Uh, when you're growing up, you want to be the best you can be at, at the the sport that you play. Um, for me, it was cricket. Cricket was the first one, um, but I was never looking back. Now I was never the the best footballer. Um, I could never kind of put it back onto the pitch. Um, maybe. Development. I was a bit of a late developer in terms of uh, maturation, um, but certainly um, it's something that I kind of thought actually, if I can't make it as a professional, simply not good enough, can I um, do my best in terms of the coaching side to learn the game, to fulfil whatever it is that, um, that I can do in the, in the few years to come. Um, and coaching was something I enjoyed and it's the next best thing to play in my eyes. Um, if you can't play it, you want to be involved in it. Um, and certainly my, my pathway was coaching um, to develop the players and give them an opportunity that maybe I think looking back I, I wish I could have had two, three coaches that, that would have helped me in my journey rather than just one coach that was potentially a parent who was running, running the team um, delivering a little bit of coaching um, so can I influence them and, and give them more of a higher level um, sense of coaching yeah, t- tell us a little more about you know what it looks like to be a, a coach within a professional academy. Um, I think it's the coaching at any any age and, and kind of any platform or level, whether that's grassroots right through to to high performance. Um, you've still got your principles, you've still got your coaching methods, um, you've still got your kind of learning theories um, and how you deliver those and, and get the message across. Um, kind of listening and trying to build up my skills and expertise, um, listening to podcasts, listening, reading books, sort of thing, and, and speaking and, and networking. I think that the fundamentals are there of, one, kind of engaging and building those relationships with the players um, to get the best out of them and understand how they work, 
understand how they process things on a basic foundation level. Um, and then if you can build the foundations from there to then drip feed the, the coaching um, elements in and, and to develop the, uh, the tactics, the technical part, the psychological part, the physical elements all into, into the coaching to, to benefit the player and better upskill the player to, to perform on, on match day or in training for them ultimately to enjoy themselves. Um, and if I would imagine if they enjoy themselves, they'll express themselves a little bit more. Uh, but in terms of kind of the academy stuff, it's we obviously have more contact than um, grassroots, which is nice. It's, you get more contact time with the players, um, you get better resources, um, you get more exposure to games, um, you get better facilities so you, you can train 365 days of the year if you wish. Certainly in the season when it's a little bit gloomy, um, you've got the, the 4G. So it's I'm quite privileged in that part that we can actually train um, and we've got no barriers in, in, or limited barriers let's say to training and, and educating and, and putting opportunities for learning on to the players yeah, the way you speak of your work with the young people your young players it sounds like there's a balance between the ultimate outcome that presumably professional academies want which is you know yeah. to produce professional footballers yeah but equally that you place importance on other developing other skills, becoming better people, as you describe. Yeah, I think from, certainly from my experiences and, and my the roles that I currently do, I see one as making them better people, um, even just down to the respect, working hard. Uh, we've got a big emphasis at the minute in both roles I do that you just work hard and you'll see the rewards from that, whether that's GCSEs, or your performance within football. Um, if you ultimately work hard, and, and I know we talk about the 1% and the marginal gains at the higher level, um, as you kind of go up the football pyramid, but can we do that um, at the younger age? Which well, can, we, can we be the hardest working player? Can we be the hardest working team today? Um, so that on the kind of broader level, it's certainly building them um, soft skills, especially from the coaching work that I do, to build the build the relationship with the person to ultimately understand them, to get the best out of them. We know the amount of people that want to be footballers, whether that's right from under sevens, right through to, to under 23s. Um, the pathway is different. The journey is different for everybody. Um, and it's kind of looking at the end destination, but being flexible in the pathway to get there. You've mentioned a couple of times there about so knowing the player and how important it is to know the player. How do you go about doing that? Um, it's building relationships, building relationships with that player, that young person, depending on the setting that you're in. And I think it's understanding how they work and their triggers, their behaviours, um, certainly how they approach you, whether that's at a training session, how they approach a game day, how they even walk in, um, whether that's to the changing room, or as they approach training, their mood, their body language, um, certainly it's kind of understanding the triggers and, and building that rapport with that, um, the player, even down to have you had a good day at school, how school been, what you've been doing over sort of lockdown, how you've been, um, how's things been at home, how's things been at school, and the current work that I do at the minute, the, the under 12s, they've gone through my transition from primary to secondary school, and they've not done the SATs, due to, to lockdown and the pandemic. Um, so a little bit of education has been lost for them and they've probably felt a little bit in the dark in what's happening um, because they've gone through a big transition of not saying goodbye to the, the primary school and as they go through that journey um, to a, a big school. Um, so it's understanding kind of how they're developing. Um, it's like everything okay? How are you being? And I think taking the role in in academies and it's kind of understanding that um, we've got a player care coordinator or a, a player liaison officer but actually us as coaches have got that primary duty first and foremost I see we've got to keep these young people safe and understand kind of how they work and we, we understand mental health is massive now um, and it kind of happens at all ages um, but it's understanding that, that young person I think building that relationship like I've said getting to know who they are, what the hobbies are, what the interests are, even down to who the favourite player is. So you can actually say, oh, did you see that on the match of the day? Or did you see that 
what trick you did there can you replicate that um, and linking it back to to something they're interested in so I think it's something they, they actually go actually he values who I am because he's he's been listening he's been referencing he's going away and watch match of the day even though we're maybe watching it anyway but we saw Jamie Vardy do that that first time finish or that volley um, so it's yeah it, it's building those relationships certainly and, and that intentional approach to developing that rapport those relationships with those players is has that always been part of your practice um yes but i think that's only come to the forefront of my mind as as i've built that experience and and built um built my experience up i think right at the start when i first started coaching i thought actually coaching just putting a session on you put a session on you'll go in there with your aims and objectives you go with your three key points you'll try coach within the curriculum within the philosophy but the more i i spend time with young people and, and broaden my experience it's certainly to get the best out of them players you need to understand how they work and even down to learning styles do you need to do a kind of a demo do you need to show it on the tactics board do you need to show them a video do you need to show them a visual um, do you need to just pull them out and while the session's going off and do a bit of drive-by coaching look can you just see that now player a has gone in there but then it is not filled that pocket of space because player b is going to do that um so it's, it's certainly delivering the full message and yeah i think over time it's it's come to it's worked its way up the ladder in terms of the continuum for me what's more important um rather than just putting the session on, delivering your, your aims and objectives. Did you meet them? No. Okay, then we'll go home. We'll try again next week. But certainly I think it's, it's looking after the player as well because we talk a lot about individuals within academies rather than team performances. Yeah, it's interesting. We've come in certainly in the last five years and before that, professional football academies have had a lot of negative mm -hmm. press levied at them, especially around... You know, the huge number of players that don't become professional footballers, not only in the club that they're at, but at any club. Um, but also the negative effects of, of particularly sort of social stuff, uh, emotional stuff and mental health, as you, as you said. So uh, really um, heartening to hear you speak in, in those terms. Yeah. Do, you, do you think some of that overlaps with your, your teaching role? Are there principles that are the same? Yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, it's... it's as, as we've spoke previously, that the the teaching I think is influencing the coaching, and I think they're coming hand in hand. Um, from the teaching, you understand how to to get those points across. Put a curriculum. You've got a curriculum in place within the, the teaching. You've got a scheme of work to work from. Our scheme of working football is is the coaching curriculum. It's the philosophy. It's the DNA of the club that you work for. Um, it's it's teaching and, and coaching come hand in hand. Um, they're both learning environments. They're both trying to get an outcome, and we are flexible in in that outcome approach. Yeah. So tell us tell us more about the the fourteen plus program. You, you mentioned that it's an alternative provision in some yeah. ways. What what makes it alternative? Yeah, it's, it's an alternative environment, and we we are no nowhere mean shape. We're, we're not a pre or pre pupil referral unit. Um, they are more behaviour units. Don't get me wrong, behaviours there. I, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say we don't experience any behaviour. We do. I think every every provision does. Um, but we we our behaviour is minimised through the relationships that we build. Certainly, um, the respect that we have as staff, um, but also the buy-in from the learners and the parents and the carers. Um, but yeah, to, to kind of give you a bit more about the alternative word. We don't have uniform, so we take that barrier away straight away. Of the uniform is not going to affect you learn, and it's not going to affect the learning journey. We talk about football, okay? In academies, you get the kit. In grassroots, you might turn it with Barnes the kit on, but then you might turn it with a rival kit on of Sheffield Wednesday. That's not going to stop that young person doing their best. Um, so we take that, we strip it right back. We um, take the uniform away. We, we treat them like adults, so we'll speak to the learners like adults. Um, we'll say, look, it's, it's a job-like environment with it being an apprenticeship. So it's more of a, an adult environment 
the staff are all known by first name terms. So it's not Mr. It's not Miss. It's not Mrs. It's not Sir. It's not Madam. It's first name terms. It's Corey. It's Tim. It's, it's that sort of thing. So it's, we're trying to get on that adult level to bring them and their maturity levels up probably sooner than what some learners are currently at. Um, in addition to that, we'll do smaller classes. So we, we have a cohort at the minute of 75 in year 11. So I manage those 75 learners and they have a, a pastoral support of one form tutor each. We'll have no more than 20 in a class. Um, that's simply to, to kind of give them extra support. Again, build those relationships with those young people um, and that extended pastoral care. The, the four form tutors that we've got in, in year 10 and year 11 will follow the different form groups around to, to offer learning support. So they're more like kind of a, a bit of a learning manager, um, academic progress. You've got your teachers that look after the academics, but then your, your form tutor will, will feed into that um, to also support that journey. Um, we, we've got a big push at the minute about interventions. So in terms of with everything that's happened with the time lost in education, we're looking at um, interventions and doing small group core work um, so the, the lesson might be going off at three or four learners who, for example, are struggling on percentages. We'll be uh, we'll leave that lesson just to master that skill off percentages, with whether it's a progress mentor, a learning mentor, or a second teacher. Um, for about ninety percent of our classes, we have two staff members. So you'll also you'll always have a teacher, so that's a lead teacher or a teacher, and then you will have um, either the learning uh, mentor or a progress mentor. So you've got two staff members always at 90% of the time in class. So that's in a nutshell and, and kind of a small, from an outside looking in, um, that's a bit out of our alternative environment. We, as I mentioned um, right at the start, we do a reduced GCSE curriculum. Rather than offering 10, 12 GCSEs, we, we really zone in on, on what learners need for life chances. So certainly English and maths, whatever um, journey they're on and where their destination is, the government say English and maths, you've got to do them. Uh, they are your two core subjects. We put science into that as well. So we've got a trio in English, maths and science to increase those life chances. Uh, we also do business, ICT, um, activities, development, which are two kind of non qual which develop the people. Um, we look at... Um, first aid for example they'll get a first aid qualification out of it we'll look at um money income money outgoing um in addition to that they'll, they'll kind of go on external visits and they'll do work experience and they'll do that within four days kind of my my favorite time of the week is, is pe um we, we don't specifically put a, a strike in a field in or athletics in place we put team building games um and, and, and fun some learners sit as primary school games your dodgeballs your handballs your footballs your bench balls danish long ball those sort of team element games where we just mix and match we do mixed pe we'll often do single sex uh, male and female um and then obviously within that we, we've got kind of learners who uh identify as um gender fluid gender neutral um we have learners who um are the lgbtq community so we're very alternative in that and we're very open and we're supportive of, of young people but the, the key selling point for the academy is they'll do that within four days so that we cram quite a lot in four days even though it's a reduced curriculum but on their fifth day so one day a week um, they will go off to um, an external department in the college and we call it a vocation option so the vocational options we, we have a small range of vocational options that run level one and two qualifications as their apprenticeship, which they can move on to next next time um, in post-16. So, for example, I teach on the sport. So I teach year 10 sport voc and I teach year 11. Um, and it's a level two qualification, but they spend the full day with me as an apprenticeship, setting them up for what happens next. So we, we get a lot who come in. For example, the girls, we have some males now that are really interested in hair and beauty. So we put them on that pathway to get them closer to the end destination of earning money in that industry two years earlier. Um, we have, like I said, the sport from, from my experience teaching. It's We get learners in who want to do sport. We'll give them the level one or two qualification depending on their outcomes. Um, they will then 
technically be a year ahead of everybody else, um, the rest of their peers in that mainstream school. Um, that all depends on the GCSE outcomes um, for each individual learner. But from that, then a lot of our learners go into apprenticeships. So that, well, that's well, our biggest unique selling point. Yeah, what a, and what a brilliant uh, description. There's obviously so much going on there that is, is so positive. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to, to pick up on. You, you mentioned in, in your, your PE, uh, and I obviously know that you, you love delivering that. What, why, why the team games approach as opposed to, as you said, like, you know, really kind of focusing on individual technique or whatever? What is it that a games based approach offers you that? Um, perhaps the more drill based doesn't yeah it's, it's it's more teaching games for understanding I think we get a lot of learners come to us and who go I hate to pee at school we were out there in all weathers and we are made to run around the field I, I think there is a place for that I really do um, we have got some athletes that are competing at um, at a good level in a variety of, of sports in the academy um, we, we do have uh, some really good um, athletic learners. Um, but then we've got the other end who they have got no interest in PE. They never will do. Um, so it, it's kind of meeting the government guidelines of giving them their statutory um, physical education, their PE sessions. But it's also making them understand that it's to have a healthy life, to support the mental health. It's good to, to run around. It's good to actually get out outside or get inside the sports hall um, and run around and, and relieve, re, release them endorphins and the stress um, that might, may be proposed through the academic subjects. Um, but certainly we, we try to go the team building aspect because we've got a variety of learners from different backgrounds um, and it's more, we go the fun approach um, and the, the teaching games for understanding certainly rather than the holistic approach of, right, let's do athletics, let's do rugby. Um, but as I mentioned, we, we do mixed, mixed gender, so we'll do dodgeball. And actually, the, the key thing that I, I found uh, when I first started teaching P at the academy in comparison to teaching P in a mainstream provision is staff get involved. So the, the PE staff, um, there's myself and two others that, that kind of qualified in PE we will do that, but then we will take, as I mentioned, a learning mentor or a progress mentor with us and we'll get involved and the learners will go, wow, well, if they can do it, so can we sort of thing. And all we ever ask of them is try the best, give it a go, try your best, which is, it's a difficult situation right at the start with learners going, oh, I hate to pee at my old school, I hate to wear certain things. And we say, actually, as long as you come in at active wear, you try your best, we can't complain. And then by the first half term, which we're approaching, I think we have 100% engagement in PE. Um, and it, it's just the transition they make from the previous school to coming to us is, is some real good progress. But again, that comes from building those relationships. Come on, we'll go play dodgeball, but if I'm playing, so are you. Um, and we'll build it up slowly. Um, and it does become quite competitive. We'll put the competitive element on it as well. So it's... Um, it's interesting, certainly, seeing the transition from when they first come in to when they leave. Yeah, and how, how you as, as staff manage that transition for them. The, the, the other thing I wanted to pick up on is you mentioned about those that perhaps want to take sport a little bit more seriously in terms of a vocation and so on. So you're also really a coach educator in your, in your role in terms of going through those level one, level two. Um, how how is it uh, teaching young people to coach when presumably they don't really have a great deal of experience of working with others? Yeah, so it's it, within the the, the current um, qualification in the budget level one two. Um, so it's a level one depending on the criteria that they meet, or it can be a level two qualification, which it would equate to the modern day GCSE grade four. Um, so it's not as a specific recognised by such as the FA or the ECB, for example. It's within the, the modules that they do, um, there's coaching involved. Um, along with kind of leading sports activities, you've got kind of training for personal fitness. Certainly in the qualification that I teach, depending on which awarding body you're going with, there's, whether it's coaching, 
sports science elements to it. Um, but it's certainly educating young people around how to deliver a session, the very fundamentals of putting a warm up in place uh, for activation, getting the blood flowing around the body. Um, and I think it's certainly educating them of what they can do. We all, we've all been on coaching courses as well, we find it a little bit awkward coaching in front of his peers or coaching peers. Um, and that's that's the biggest barrier we face, that actually you've got to coach your peers. I know, but they'll laugh at me if I'm doing that. Well, you put your session on, let's see where we come to it. It's trial and error. It's never going to be perfect on the first delivery, but we'll practice and practice and practice to build up your experience for you to become comfortable in that environment. Um, and a lot of it's probably shit pushing them outside the comfort zone um, and providing that challenge aspect. Um, but from like a, a coach, it's more of a, as you say, it's a coach education point of view. Um, it's educating, not just in coaching, educating life skills, um, even down to, to the gym programs that they do and put in place for themselves. They are coaching themselves, the learners. So it's, it's certainly education as a whole approach. Yeah, I, I, and I mean, it just sounds like you have a wonderful handle on on the the, the programs and and the positives that that program can can produce. Clearly, you're 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 going to have to balance that with your part time work with with Barnsley. Um, you know, this is a common it's a common problem for part time national football coaches. How does that show up for you? How do you balance those? It's challenging. It certainly is. Um, I spend quite a lot of time out of the house, um, which sometimes it's, it's it's challenging. It's challenging for me. Uh, the fiance, it's hard that the time that we spend together is often limited. If we've got an away fixture on the Sunday, um, that's two, three hours away. Um, that's, that's a full day taken up. It's a full day at work. Um, so it's certainly a six, seven day a week role that I do together in, in both roles. Um, but it's something I enjoy, something I'm passionate about, especially the, the coaching um, aspect. And it's some it's probably a long term vision of mine to hopefully work in football full time. Um, it's something I, I aspire to do. Um, if that happens, I'll, I'll I'd like to give it a go. Um, but currently, I enjoy working in, in both settings, um, and it's finding the, the right balance um, to do both. It's Certainly, the planning aspect for both of them, especially the coaching, with it only being um, part time, it's prioritising that time to plan um, to make sure that these sessions are highly quality, they're ha of a high quality, um, getting the best out of the players. Uh, because ultimately, it's an elite environment. We call it it's in a professional academy. It's elite, um, and that's no disrespect to the fourteen plus friendship academy. Um, We've got the two different journeys they're on. Um, one is the choose to be there in terms of the professional football academy, where school, college, they've got to be there. So it's matching them up and finding the similarities and differences, um, comparing and contrasting the skills, um, differentiating different skill sets and, and messages that we need to get across. But time is the biggest, biggest one. I wish there were more than 24 hours in a day to, to do more, to put a little bit more planning in um, but also have a little bit of time away so you can rest, recover and do do your own little bits and your own hobbies and interests as well um, but yeah it's, I enjoy it I, it's something I've always wanted to do being involved in sport I am um, it's not easy, it's challenging but it's all building the experience and ultimately be, making me want a better, better coach better person um, and it's experience. It's all experience that I can take and then deliver to the next cohort of players that I coach, the next team I get, the next intake of um, students that we get in the academy. It's, I can build on my experience and pass that knowledge, expertise on. Brilliant. You you mentioned there that you know you're hoping that you'll be able to work in football full time. What what would what does that look like in terms of you know taking control of your career and trying to push that forward? How do you do it? Um, currently, um, I've enrolled on the MSc Advanced Coaching um, Football Performance at the University of South Wales. So I'm really looking forward to undertaking that, taking coaching to the next level. 
but ultimately taking my football experience academically to the next level. Um, it's something I probably found in the last 18 months from finishing the PGC that I, I did. Um, learning, it's, you've got to learn. I think learning's part of life. It's an everyday approach, um, whether that's through academic, the development, listening, reading, writing. Um, speaking to people, we're on that learning journey. I don't think you ever stop learning. It's, it's cliche. We all hear it, but it's, I just want to develop and keep, keep learning. It it's, probably sounds a little bit geeky. Um, I think I, I've matured enough now where I just want to learn new things and and be the best person I can be to, to ultimately provide for myself, ultimately, in terms of the job, but also do something I enjoy um, and take that to the next level if I can. So I mentioned obviously the MSC. Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll within that I'll complete the UFRA license, which frustratingly will meet the criteria of a full-time coach within an academy. Um, so that'll meet the essential criteria, um, and then it's just again building experience, building the knowledge, um, short-term kind of work up the age groups in, in youth development, and at the under 12s now. Hopefully, the A license, the MSC. Will, Will allow me to a little bit more exposure um, to the older age groups uh, within the within the academy, um, and continue learning, continue building that experience, and hopefully one day an opportunity will come uh, where it's right for me. It's, it's at the right time, um, so hopefully that that'll that'll happen. If not, it's, I'm sure there'll be a different door open, um, whether that's in ten years' time, in twelve months' time. Um, that's the long-term vision, if I can, and um, just being flexible about that approach to to get there. Well, good good luck with that that journey. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, you know, and so many of us are on it, but I, you know, I wanted to ask you. Obviously, in in sort of foundation phase on the twelves at the moment, uh, so maybe youth development phase, um, and I got the sense there that you see the career path as as going up age groups in order to find something that's maybe more full-time is is that what you meant by that it's about finding then a full-time opportunity or you genuinely want to work with older age groups um currently i enjoy working with the under 12s i do um i would like to work to keep working up the pyramid in terms of the age groups um i think the first step would be a full-time role um potentially um, as a youth development phase coach, a lead coach. Um, and I think long term, I'd, I'd set the aspirational goal at the under 18s. Um, that's something I'd like to work towards, um, to work full time, and then see, see where that approach comes. Um, if that doesn't come there, it might be to look elsewhere at maybe a non league and work at the non league pyramid. Um, and that might not necessarily be um, a full time role in football. It might continue to be the part time and have the education at work hand in hand. Um, but I, I like the competitive element. Um, the, the academy is competitive. It is. It's, we talk about it's not about winning, it's not about um, the results on a weekend, but there's still competitive elements in there in regards to can you go and win your 1v1 battle? That's competitive. So we still put that competitive nature into to the players, and, and all players want to win. Um, it's about the journey that we tell them that they're on rather than the winning element and the competitive nature that they want to outreach um, to everybody else. But I think, yeah, it, it's a journey. We'll see where, it, where we go with that. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but if not, that's fine. It's, I'm sure there'll be another avenue or another venture that is just as challenging and just as rewarding, but also in, this, in the sports industry as well. Yeah, I just wanted to ask because it's it's quite a common journey for football coaches and I'm sure in other sports too to begin their career in the professional environment with younger age groups and then systematically make their way through closer and closer to adult football and clearly there's a potential problem with that of there might be people out there who are especially good at working with the younger age groups. In order to get full-time work, they have to push 
uh, and look towards working with with older age groups do, do you have any 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 opinions on that um i do i think it depends which approach you want to come from and and i've got friends within within football and, and we network all the time um but some coaches like working with the younger age groups that's their experience where they've had their experience um, and building up that experience and i think when you are a non-ex-professional footballer um that you generally have to start learning the academy game and learning the professional football environment um whereas if you've had 20 years playing professionally or you've you become a, a scholar gone into kind of the professional game and you have more knowledge you're in that exposure day to day so therefore yes you have got um the knowledge and skill set of the game and understanding of the tactical element um, of going straight into um a higher age group within youth development phase um, and that's no disrespect to i don't think coaches like myself who's not played professionally um it's it's two different journeys that everybody's on everybody's on a different journey but if you've not played the game professionally i think you you have to start a little bit lower down and that's just how football works um but that's not necessarily to say that if you've not played professionally you're not going to be a good coach and if you have played professionally in my opinion there's players that played professionally that may not be the best coach um everybody's different everybody's got their own different styles different coaching philosophies um, and how they implement and get their messages across um but i think it's it all depends on the individual um i'm a big believer in the experience you've got to build up the experience regardless of your background if you want to be good at anything you've got to build up the repetition the number of hours that you do um the number of conversations the number of sessions you do the number of interventions in terms of right can i just do do that to a player can i put in a coach intervention just to alter their body position so they can play forward um it's having that increased experience to ultimately give you as many opportunities so actually when something does arise you can go actually I can relate to that and come back to it um because that happened to me x amount of years ago yeah, clearly you're you're building up that experience as uh, as quickly as you can with how, how hard you're working and with the hours that you're putting yeah. in can, before i really let you go can you tell us about a, a real success story in either of those environments that you work in um yeah don't get me wrong I, we've probably spoke a lot a lot of positives uh, today and, and that's what I kind of we like we like to hear the success stories um but within coaching within education there is a lot of down days as well where you you will walk away and go i might have got that wrong um actually that session that i delivered there i didn't get the best out of the players that performance from the players wasn't good enough we need a little bit more um i've had a bad day in education um for a variety of different reasons and you've been told to to do one and go away um to put it politely but we we want the positives and th- there's a lot of down days where you actually probably question yourself why you do it um but we do it because one for the love of the game in football and and to education you're giving something back and to develop the next generation but in terms of success stories there's there's a few players that I've worked with um that have gone and gone on and, and and struggled at times um that have struggled especially in the academy journey we've done a bit of an intervention whether that's a bit of a meeting uh we've spoke about um what may go wrong or what might um, might be the success what they're having at the minute or at that present time to ultimately push them on that journey a little bit more and they've come out of it to um, still in the academy system there's um a couple of players that um I can think of that when I did a, a bit of an internship before I, I went in at Barnes when I was at Fields United now I've gone on to play professionally um there's a, a couple of players in there that I observed at under 18 level that um have gone on to play for the country um but then again there's some that are playing non league football um some that I didn't think would actually go as far as they have done but through the hard work determination that they've, they've put in they've got to where they are um so it's they they there is a lot of success stories that I've seen 
Um, but I think the key thing and the, probably the key thing that people take out of the podcast, hopefully, is in them building those relationships and making those people and players better people. And there's players that, that I've seen that have come out of it because there's been so much pressure in academy football. They've actually gone, actually, I can just relax now. Um, there's not a, not pressure on from parents, from family, from the club, from the coaches. Uh, but you've also got the element of, that's I need to put my socks up now. I need to do a little bit better, which has led to success. Um, so there's been a lot of successes, certainly, um, which I can look back and go, yeah, I, I've observed 1% of that person's journey to where they've got, or I've influenced their journey by 1%. I'm sure you'll have plenty more opportunities to to influence the next generations coming through. Yes. Corey, thanks so much for your time. Uh, do I have one last question for you, which is yes. if you could have an audience with just one person, who would you choose? Audience with one person? Does it have to be coaching or could it be? Whoever you anybody? want. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go non-sport related um, and the, the reason being is I've, I'm halfway through um, his last book and I'm going to go for Anthony Middleton um, and the reason why is he, I've watched the SAS Who Dares Wins and I've, I've read all three of almost all three of his books now um, and it, it's the, the mindset that he has um, for high performance and, and the elite and it might not be elite, uh, football elite in sport, but he's kind of elite in terms of the way he thinks and the positivity that he puts forward. So I would certainly like to sit down and just pick his brain, even if it's spent half an hour buying him a coffee, um, and just to find out what he's he's kind of been through in a little bit more detail and if there's any advice that he can give, certainly to me, so I can learn from it. But yeah, it would have to be Anthony Middleton at this minute in time. It's interesting. There's, there's obviously for us as sports coaches, we do tend to gravitate towards those those people that work within sport. But the, as you rightly say, there's so much to be gained from from other areas of life. So um, yeah, I'm sure that would be an interesting conversation. Corey, thank you so much for your time uh, and, and and your energy today. Uh, if if anyone wanted to reach out to you, what what would be the best way to do that? Yeah. Um through twitter linkedin um certainly um i'll be honest i don't tweet much um i don't put a lot on on social media it's more retweets um but certainly reach out i'm happy to kind of liaise network with people um answer any questions that people may have um but yeah twitter's the, the probably the best one linkedin also super thank you so much not a problem. Thanks, Tim, and thanks for having me. That's it for episode 11 with Corey Roebuck. His details are in the description should you want to reach out to him and follow his work. The music you are listening to is by BB Phoenix. And just one left in season one of the pod before we take a short break. Thanks for listening and engaging, and we look forward to having you back here for the last one on Sunday. <laughs>